looking for God and living life with joy and ever-present smile. Rabbi Cohen and Diane, his wife, are the grateful parents of six daughters. For more information about Rabbi Cohen, you can always go to his website, rabbidanielcohen.com. It is my uh, distinct honor to uh, introduce Rabbi Daniel Cohen. Um, Alex, thank you very much for that really warm intro from the heart. I really appreciate that, your friendship and uh, connecting me to uh, the men's uh, clubs. And uh, I really appreciate everyone taking the time tonight. Bob, thank you for uh, hosting this evening. I want to give a special shout out to Gary uh, Smith as well, who I believe is on this phone um, call also. Um, I first really want to start by, I think it's important to uh, offer a prayer for healing. Uh, for all those who uh, need a refuah shalema, speedy recovery. Um, unfortunately, we're living at a time right now when there's not many degrees of separation from people that we know that may have been ill, God forbid, or, 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 or in need. And, and God willing, uh, God will grant them a refuah shalema, a God willing, a speedy recovery very, very soon. Um, I also want to uh, acknowledge, uh, again, it's so important during this time, a thank you uh, to all those um, in our midst who are helping us get through this time. You know, this has certainly been a, uh, a challenging time, uh, but really it's important to acknowledge, which I'm sure everyone is doing in their own communities, uh, the first responders, uh, people that are doing the deliveries, people at the hospitals, um, and it's important to recognize them at this moment as well. Um, Alex, I think you said it uh, best, and it's really, I would say, on all of our minds, um, that we are experiencing an awakening in really a moment uh, like none other than uh, of all of us have uh, experienced um, it, it ever, where our worlds are turned upside down. Uh, there is uh, uncertainty where we felt it was certainty. And certainly in many ways, um, these moments when we truly see the fragility of life, the fragility of life, each and every one of us who's on this call is able to take a breath of air. We can sit here, we can breathe, thank God without assistance, but not everybody's able to do that. And in this moment when we can take that breath, it's to a certain degree a opportunity to pause and as you said, reflect on our lives, reflect on how do we manage the crisis that we're experiencing, but also how do we harness what is inside of us to transform a difficult time, an obstacle into an opportunity, and not only see this moment as a burden, but rather somehow to find the hidden blessings moving forward. As I shared um, when I was in Toronto, uh, this whole concept really and the um, catalyst for the book stems from my own life, uh, which was my mother's sudden passing from a brain aneurysm when she was 44 years old. Uh, my entire life uh, um, and certainly when I turned 44, I began to think more deeply about the fact that life can change in an instant. Nobody on the Zoom call could have imagined two months ago the kind of world that we're existing in right now. And the question is not only how in this moment of awakening do we actually stay true to what is most significant in our lives, but how do we harness this moment so that In our synagogue, like what does it look like? We can look back on this moment. Hopefully, we'll have become better people. Hopefully, we will have become more present in the relationships that we have. And also, hopefully, the world will become a little bit of a better place. And what I want to do this evening with you is, to a certain degree, focus a little bit on what does it mean to really think about, number one, what this moment is and how we can harness this moment. Judaism tells us that whenever there is a crisis that happens in the world, there are two choices that we have. And those two choices are to either see the events that we're experiencing right now as being, well, there was just a virus in China that came here and we're kind of managing it and it's coincidental how things happen. Or we can try to see a little bit more meaning within what we're experiencing as opposed to just being a random sequence of events. Maimonides himself says in his laws in Mishnah Torah, he says that if an event happens in the world, 
we cannot say that it is random, but rather we have to believe that in some way there is something that is experiencing in my life where God is speaking to me and I now have to pay attention a little bit more to how God is calling me in this moment to rise to my best self. I have no right to say to anybody else that something happened tragically in their life because of what something or somebody did. That's impossible. I have no right to do that. But I do have a responsibility as we were sharing to look deep inside myself and to say, what is God asking of me in this moment in the world that touches me? This is very clear at the very beginning of the book of Vayikra and the book of Leviticus, where the first word is, it says Vayikra, that God calls to Moses. And there, if you look very carefully, I'm not going to quiz you right now because then everybody's on mute, except for Alex, it looks like. Alex, nod your head. Okay, maybe I'll quiz you in front of everybody over here, but I won't quiz at you right now. <laughs> but if you look in every single Torah scroll, the cry, he, he, very smart man, he just muted himself. Okay. Um, but if you look all across the world, in the Torah, you'll see the very first word is Vayikra, the last letter is an Aleph, and that Aleph is called an Aleph Zi'ira, it's a small Aleph. And the reason why it's a small Aleph, because the word Vayikra can mean God is calling us, or the word Vayikar, which means God happened to connect with me. And the question we have whenever we experience something is do we see it as a Vayikar moment? that it just happened? Or do we see it as a Vayikra moment? How am I, to a certain degree, responding to this moment, to the responding to what I'm experiencing, to hopefully hear God's call? Nobody would have wished that the world would be going through this right now, but to a certain degree, I like to call these moments the Sabbath of COVID. The entire world, in many ways, we are turning off outside noises, to hopefully during this time hear a little bit of an inner voice that is speaking to each and every one of us. And that is an opportunity. That is a blessing that we have. If you take it a little bit further, there is a question that God is asking all of us. The Hebrew word is vayikra, God is calling us. But where in the Bible is the first place where God says the word vayikra? The first place is where God speaks to Adam and Eve after the sin in the Eitz Hadat, the tree of knowledge. And God says to Adam, Vayikra. He says, where are you? Where are you? And obviously God knows exactly where Adam and Eve is. It's a deeper question. Where are you is, where are you as a human being? Where are you as an neshama, as a soul? Are you carrying out your life mission the way I hoped and planned for you to carry out? Are you being the best father that you can be? Are you being the best wife that you can be? The best son that you can be? The best soulful person that you can be? Where are you? Are you answering my call with Hineni? I am here to focus on what is truly important in my life. Or am I trying to block out, which many of us do, you know, as soon as life gets back to normal, and that's the, the shout, tragedy of it. As a rabbi, oftentimes, I will never hear from people in synagogue until, God forbid, somebody's in a hospital. They'll call me up and they'll say, Rabbi, pray for me. And then I'll never hear from them again, not because, God forbid, the person died, but then life goes back as usual. But it's in that moment when we sense that fragility, when here's an opportunity to begin to ask deeply, those questions to answer God's call of where are you and to be able to think deeply, which I write about in the book, what do I want to be remembered by? How am I living my life in a way as if today is my last day? Am I fully present with those around me? There is no question that each and every one of us has so much potential to realize, so much more that we can accomplish in our lives. I'm not talking about jobs. I'm not talking about material accumulations. I'm talking about realizing the gift of every day and then sharing that gift that we have with those that are truly important and those around us. And that's really the gift of this opportunity that we have. I want to frame my response tonight first by quoting, it's a wonderful book if you have not read, 
and that is Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Viktor Frankl was a psychiatrist from Austria, and he was in the Holocaust, and he wrote a book about what motivates people to emerge from the Holocaust with a greater sense of meaning, and what unfortunately prevented people from actually being able to transcend the difficulty in the Holocaust. Some people renew their faith, and some people lost their faith. And Viktor Frankl writes, and to me this is the crux of how we address the challenge of this moment. He says, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. We cannot control what happens to us, but we can control how we see the world around us to be able to uplift the world in some small way and choose to respond in a positive way. When you listen to the news too much, I don't know how many of you listen to the news, whether it's Fox, CNN, I'm not talking politics, but sometimes we bombard ourselves with so much anxiety, so much fear during this time, that we get stuck in a place where we're just lamenting the fate that we're experiencing, as opposed to what Viktor Frankl is suggesting in the Jewish approach, rather than lament our fate, it's a moment to choose a new destiny. It's a moment to grow through the struggle. It's a moment to realize the best of what is inside of us. And the roadmap in that silence is something called the secret of the light that touched me and really meant a lot to me this particular summer. And I wanna share it with you. To me, the secret of the light is a roadmap for addressing not only becoming our best selves now, but also how we manage crisis and struggle in our life and how we grow as people, grow as families and grow as communities. This past summer, I had the opportunity for the first time to go to Poland. We took about 35 people from our synagogue on an adult March of the Living program. And while I was there, it was a summer day in July. I was walking on the countryside in Poland in the shadow of a farmhouse. The sun was bright and there was a soft breeze that whispered in the air. The grass was lush and there were modest homes that were dotted the countryside in this town called Markova. When we arrived at a barn, I had absolutely no idea why we were at this barn. But then when I learned about the backstory, I discovered that the place where I was walking in Markova was one of the holiest places on earth. And from the depths of my soul, I realized that in a certain area where I walked, literally heaven was touching earth. And before I tell you what happened in that village in Markova at the farmhouse, I wanna share with you the secret of the light. The secret of the light is a mystical concept that goes all the way back to the beginning of creation. It says that on the first day of creation, the world was filled with chaos, disorder, and darkness. And then at the very beginning, it says in the very first section of the Torah, Vayomer Lokim, God says, Vayihi Or, let there be light, and there was light. And Judaism teaches us that a ray of darkness emerged, a ray of light emerged from this darkness. But the light was so powerful that the vessels containing that light broke, and the light was scattered into infinite fragments. And that hidden light fell into all people and all events yet to be born, who have been born and throughout history. And those fragments of light remain hidden in the universe until this day. And then on the sixth day of creation, God created humanity. And humanity was a response to the hidden light that existed within the world. And God said to mankind, whatever faith you are, your role in this world is to uncover the hidden sparks that I planted in all time and all events and all relationships. And if you can reveal that light in the moment that you're experiencing, you can bring some light to the places of darkness, you can bring hope to places of despair, and bring healing to places of hurt. And when I realized that message, I understood what was happening and why in that village in Markova in the summer of 1942, there was some light that was revealed. 
it was one night and there was a family that lived there. They were called the Omas. The Omas were a Catholic family that were blessed with six children. And in the middle of the night, there were two Jewish families that came knocking on their door. And those Jewish families were being hunted down by the Nazis. And in that moment, they asked the Omas if they could stay in their house. And the Omas in that moment had a choice. The choice could have been for their own safety. Do they tell these two families not to come in? Or do they risk their lives to protect those Jewish families? And for 18 months, every day they made a choice to risk their lives to save these two Jewish families. Unfortunately, after 18 months, the Nazis found the Omas. The Nazis murdered both parents. The Nazis murdered the six children. The Nazis murdered the two Jewish families. But their model of what they did in that moment, this family, serves as a stirring reminder of the capacity of this family or anybody to reveal the hidden light in that moment, in that time. Each and every one of us is in this world for a reason. There is no person on this Zoom call who is created exactly the same. And God brought us into this world, according to the mystics, it says that on your birthday, the day that you're born, Rav Nachman of Breslau says, is the day that God decided the world needed you. It's the day that God decided the world needed us. And when we wake up in the morning, when we take that breath, God is saying that in the world that I've created with you in this moment, there is some bit of light, some bit of light that you can reveal that has not yet been revealed in order to elevate the world around you. That message of the secret of the light, to me, is one of the most important roadmaps for how we navigate any challenge that takes place, particularly this one. Rather than look outside of us and say, why is this happening? The question is, what is happening presently in the life that is right around me that I can reveal some light in that moment to help move forward within the world? There's another amazing story from the Holocaust that to me also is a stirring reminder of what it means to reveal that light. And that is a fellow who many of us may not know, but his name was Aristides de Sousa Mendes. He was the Portuguese consul general in the French city of Bordeaux during World War II. He was recognized by Yad Vashem as a righteous Gentile. And he was in a place of time when he was in charge of issuing refugees to Jews that were fleeing the Nazis. And while in France, he befriended Rabbi Chaim Tzvi Kruger. And Susan Mendez offered a visa to the Kruger family, which is very difficult to get. But in response, Rabbi Kruger took a moral stand and refused to accept the visas. He came to Mendez's office and he said to him, I will not take this visa unless you give a visa to all the Jews in this town that need the visa. And Kruger plunged Susa into a moral crisis of incalculable proportions. The pressure was great, and his family urged him not to do it. And he responded, and he said in that moment of moral crisis, he said, I would rather stand with God against man than man against God. I'd rather stand with God against man than man against God. And in that moment, he exhibited the courage to make the right choice and ultimately to reveal a little bit more of that light. I believe that when we are conscious of this message, of focusing on the world that is around us in this moment, it's possible to hopefully not be extricated from this moment. And we hope that healing happens very soon, but to be able to zone in on the present experience that we have so that we can truly respond in a positive way. And I want to share with you a few ideas this evening about how we respond. How do we hear the call of God? How do we harness this moment of awakening? And how do we reveal in our own worlds some of that light? 
And one of the ideas I want to share with you is something I touched on before, but share with you some different ideas related to it. And that is one of the greatest challenges we have is that of what I call living inspired and being fully present in the moment that we're experiencing right now. Too many of us have what's called CPA. It's not easy, by the way, on Zoom, because I have no idea what people are doing right now. But it's not easy. CPA means continuous partial attention. We're worried here. We're thinking about what happened yesterday. We're thinking about what I have to do at the end of this call. I don't believe that we are on this call by accident. This is a present moment. And as Robert Gruden says in his book, Time and the Art of Living, one of the secrets to truly living a life of legacy is figuring out a way to take fleeting moments and make them eternal. The mark of a great life, and I've had unfortunately numerous funerals to do over the past number of weeks, is thinking about our life not in length of years. We can't determine how many years we are on this earth, but we can determine what we do with the days, we can to do what we do with the hours and what we do with the minutes. And being fully present in the moment we're experiencing. Life is made up of memories. If you ask me what I did two weeks ago, I can't tell you. But I can tell you that I remember that I put some stuff down and decided to take a walk with one of my children or take a walk with somebody who I cared about. Or I decided to get on the phone and make that phone call because it's the memories that we share that ultimately is what defines who we are. It's being fully present. And God says to us every morning, I'll check you guys right now, when you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing that you say in the morning? What do you say? Nod your head if you know. Nod your head, thank you, good, you're nodding your head. You wake up in the morning and you say, Moda Ani, thank you. Thank you, God, that you gave me life. But you also say, thank you, God, Rabba Emunatecha. Rabba Emunatecha means not great God is my faith in you, but great God is your faith in me that you believe in. When I wake up in the morning and I can take a deep breath, I believe that God is giving me a bear hug and God is saying, he doesn't call me Rabbi Cohen. He says, Daniel Yaakov. He says, I believe in you. I gave you this breath today because there's something today that you can accomplish. So be mindful that's going to be different than tomorrow and different than yesterday. And that's the mindset to have in order to be truly living in the present. There was a, I would say, very moving story that occurred. It was reported on CNN a couple of weeks ago about a doctor. His name was Dr. Ergal. He was an emergency physician in Brooklyn. And he shared the following story. He said he was in the middle of all the madness in Brooklyn Hospital for COVID. And there was a 100-year-old Hasidic lady there with COVID pneumonia. And he said, I was desperate to send her home so she wouldn't die in the hospital. But she dropped her blood pressure and we had to keep her. Her son kept calling me to find out how she was and I finally told him, she's 100 years old with pneumonia in both lungs, she's not good, she's not doing well. And then he wanted to talk to her and he said, and I said, you can't, I'm busy, call back 10 minutes later. Your mother's not conscious anymore anyway. And he said, that's okay, I just wanna pray for her. And something inside of him said he needed to stop all the chaos. And he said, I'm going to take your phone and I'll put it to this woman's ear. He said, I had 10 other pressing things to do, but I stopped what I was doing out of respect for this 100-year-old woman. And I put the cell phone on speakerphone and told him to talk. Then he started to say a special prayer and he began to cry. He barely got the words out and I saw that she had numbers tattooed on her arm. He was crying for his mother and praying the Shema, the verses of unity, and it woke up some emotion in me that I had forgotten about. Time slowed down and I felt restored to myself. When he was done, he thanked me and blessed me, and I said thank you to him. How many times do we oftentimes miss the most important moments because our mind is not fully present? We can bring down and be inspired and realize God's presence in a moment and bring heaven down to earth at any time. I want you right now, this is a bit risky, 
Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Arbach said, you know, we oftentimes live with a sense of anxiety and not always feeling that gift of God's presence of every day. I want you to take a moment to write down, I'm going to give you like two minutes right now, write down times in your life, somebody's nodding their head, not sure if they have time, you don't have to if you don't want to, <laughs> but I'd like you to write down, right, I'm giving you a gift by the way, this is not a burden, you don't have to do it, but this is actually a present that I'm giving you. So you can unwrap it or you don't have to take it. But here's the deal. Write down a time in your life or a few times when you felt that God really helped you out. Write down a time when you were going in for a test and you were hoping and praying that everything would work out okay. And write, you know, God willing it was negative. Write down the blessings in your life where you have felt God's presence and what you're grateful for. Just take a minute or two to write that down. I am still going to be here, but I'd like you to try to do that for a few minutes. But Shlomo Zalman Arbach writes, you know, there's a prayer that we say every day, which is moda anila fanacha, not moda, we say modim, that we thank God for God's presence in our life. And when we take that piece of paper and we begin to reflect on those blessings, we really begin to think even more so about what it means to experience and to be grateful for the present moment that we have. We say at the very end of the book of Psalms, the last Psalm 150, King David says, kol haneshama tahaloka that my entire soul gives thanks to God. And the soul and body, King David is saying, wants to separate. But that moment that we're experiencing, when God breathes into us the breath of life, it's a moment to be fully mindful of that particular moment. And that is a challenge. That is a challenge at this time. It's a challenge sometimes to be fully present with those that are physically around me. When you're sitting at a table to put your phone down, to tune it all off so that we can be fully present with those that are around us. But that's really what God is asking. You know, it's interesting. God has said, I want everyone to be home. I, by the way, find it's been very difficult sometimes, even at home, because we're so virtually connected. As a rabbi now, I'm less busy on Shabbat because I get to stay home. But during the week, it's a very busy time. But there's a message here to be fully engaged and present in the world that is right around me. I'm reminded of, uh, I don't know if you saw the, uh, the movie with Tom Hanks, Mr. Rogers, but it was a great movie. Not that I'm a movie, uh, you know, see all of them, but you know, when he gets a phone call, he asks the reporter, he says, what do you think is the most important thing right now for me? And uh, Mr. Rogers responds, he says, the most important thing right now is that I'm talking to you. The most important thing is that I'm speaking to you right now with no other distractions and that you are the center of my universe. So one of the key ideas I think that God is calling us to do is to be more inspired, more mindful, to create more memories, to seize these moments, to open up our hearts in that moment, because when we do, happen today, I'm not patting this on my back, I was in the middle of work, one of my daughters said, I gotta go outside, I'm gonna play horse outside. I was busy, but I said to myself, how am I gonna remember this day a year from now, a week from now. All right, I have a few other emails to respond to, but I'm not gonna forget that I lost a horse to my daughter, what can I say? But I will remember that I went outside there. That's what God is saying. Create those memories, be present, and appreciate the blessings of the breath, and then make the most of every day that God has given us. I wanna to move to another idea that to me also helps us realize our best self. And that is the power that we have, not only to reveal the light in ourselves and discover our own potential, but to share that light with others. Something I've chatted about a lot, and I'm not gonna go through the whole story now, but I talked about it when I was there in Toronto, is a notion that's in the book called the Elijah Moment. And the Elijah Moment is a concept 
that really reminds us that we may not be able to change the world, but each one of us can change the world of one person. There's a woman in my community, her name is Liat Karsh, and uh, she had a close friend who uh, died a number of years ago at a young age in her 40s, and this girl's uh, parents would oftentimes come to Agadat Shalom. And it's amazing, they treat Liat as their daughter, and they come to their smachot, the different celebrations, and I once went over to the parents of Kiddush and said, it's wonderful to have you here. But what draws you to continue to come back, even though your daughter, who's the best friend of Liat, is no longer here? And they said, well, on the days before our daughter was passing away, she, we learned she said something to Liat. She said to Liat, I know all my friends are going to move on with their life, but can you make sure that you always stay close to my parents. And then after she died, this girl would always call her parents on Friday afternoon to wish her a good Shabbos. And the parents told me that ever since their daughter passed away, Liat takes five minutes on a Friday to call them and wish them a good Shabbos and say that it's from their daughter, Talia. All it takes is five minutes, but for the parents, it's the entire world. It's the entire world. And God is saying to us, if there is somebody in your environment, we don't believe that we have prophecy today, but the Baal Shem Tov said that if I get a phone call from somebody, if there's somebody who is in my life, God is saying, you know what? You, we need to find a way. I put you, that person, in your life for a reason. Try to make their day and lift up their day and spread a little bit of their light. Mark Twain said the two most important days of our life are the day when we're born and the day we understand why. The day we understand why. And we live with that awareness that in that encounter, there's an opportunity to share light. It could only be for 15 minutes. We may never see that person again. We have an opportunity to look back and realize that I truly made a difference in that person's life. I like, and hopefully we'll get back to this, I find that I can create a lot of Elijah moments in Ubers. Maybe one day we'll have Ubers again. I don't know. Hopefully we will. But I was in uh, Albany not too long ago, and it was 5.30 in the morning in Rochester, excuse me, in an Uber. And, uh, you know, you have these moments when it's really early in the morning, and you decide, should I engage or should I not engage? Should I say something to this person or just pretend that I'm asleep? So as we were leaving the hotel, the guy said, oh, did you eat at the restaurant at the hotel? So I could have said to him, I wasn't hungry. Or I could have said to him, you know what? I'm kosher. It wasn't a kosher restaurant. But then I didn't know where I was going to go. So I decided in that moment, I said to him, you know what? I keep kosher and I don't eat at the restaurant. And then I decided in that moment to reveal it. And he said to me, by the way, I just want you to know, this is 5.30 in the morning in Rochester, New York, in an Uber. He said to me, I'm not Jewish, but my son is Jewish. Now, at that point, I was pretty tired, but I said, like Paul Harvey would say, can you please tell me the rest of the story? So this is what he said. He said to me that he was in college. He had a Jewish girlfriend. I see people are getting close because they really want to know, like, what in the world happened over here? He said when he was in college, he had a Jewish girlfriend. He didn't know that she became pregnant. And it turns out she gave up the baby for adoption. And his son was adopted by a Jewish family. And he expressed to me how grateful he was that this Jewish family for looking after his son, and he considers them parents. And then at six in the morning on the way to the airport, and he said, recently his son reached out to him. His son is now 21. And he said to me, they are meeting for the first time in New York. And as we were getting out of the car at the airport, he said to me, I want to show you a picture of my son and his adopted family. Doesn't my son look like me? And then he smiled and he said, thank you for allowing me to share that story in my heart. Nobody ever did that before. I only told my family about seeing my son. And as we said goodbye and the sun began to rise, I truly felt that there was something hidden from the very beginning of time that God was enabling me to reveal. I was in the cab for 20 minutes. In that moment, there was the possibility of lifting up some light around us. 
we are living in a world right now where a lot of people are feeling isolated. A lot of people are feeling vulnerable. But that doesn't mean that we can't use this opportunity to strengthen connections, to create a sense of hope within people. We started something in our synagogue, and I encourage you to do it. It's called Making Mitzvah Moments. We started within days of quarantine. We're on WhatsApp. I asked people, do you want to be involved in instantaneous mitzvah help? Now we have 140 people. And what happens is, if somebody says, I'm in quarantine, can you get to CVS? And within five minutes, somebody says, I'll go and do CV. These people don't know each other. But we've seen the power within seconds to help people. We're delivering 45 to 50 challahs every Friday to seniors. And within 10 minutes, people volunteer to do it. It creates, within seconds, opportunities to be able to lift things up. We can change a life. It doesn't take a lot. It says the smallest value of time is Judaism says you have a sha'a is an hour, a rega is a minute, and Judaism has something called a chelek. We say this, by the way, when we bless the new moon. A chelek is three and a half seconds. Why is a chelek three and a half seconds? Because Judaism says that in three and a half seconds you could change somebody's life. And the model of that is Joseph when he's in jail. Joseph is sitting in his own darkness, lamenting the fate that he's sitting in prison. And he asks a question. He says, you know, I could worry about my own problems. But then he sees the butler and the baker from across the room. And he says to them, why do you guys look so sad? And once he recognizes and sees the face of God in another human being, it becomes a catalyst for the rest of the story. That's our responsibility. That's our opportunity. And the world that we're all connected to is so vastly different that each in our own way can light that flame. And that flame, God willing, will truly ignite the hidden sparks within the world. And I believe, and this is also, I think, so critical for how we maximize this moment, that God is going to give us renewed energy. One of the things I write about in the book is it's not always easy to stay inspired and present. And it's not always easy to share that light and do the best that we can. But as I said, I asked Esther Youngrice, was a mentor of mine, Rebetzin Esther Youngrice, phenomenal person. She passed away a number of years ago, but she was tireless. She was a survivor of the Holocaust, and she impacted thousands of people. And I said to her once when she came to visit, what is your secret? Like, how do you gain that energy all the time? She said to me, three times a day, I pray to God for strength. It says in the book of Isaiah, Kobe Hashem Yachalifu Koach. Those who have faith in God, their strength will be renewed. They will grow wings like eagles. They will run and not walk. She felt literally she's a conduit. Nobody here is operating on their own. If we say every morning that I know, God, you gave me this life, not for myself, but you gave me this life so that I can bring your presence in my family. I can bring your presence to my synagogue. I can bring your presence and help somebody in my business community, my neighbors. Then God says, you're on my team. Literally, God says, you're on my team. It says in Psalms, David says, give me your burdens. God says, I'll help you. I want to help you. And it's that idea of recognizing that we're partners with God, each and every one of us, that will, God willing, give us the strength. Strength we never felt possible to turn an obstacle into an opportunity, to turn a burden into a blessing. Because all it takes is to light one candle. One candle can illuminate an entire room. And it's not only a woman's job to light candles, we all gotta light candles. I just remind and I'll conclude with a story about a Chabad rabbi that went to Alaska because he felt like there must be a Jew there he has to help. And he went to the mayor of the small town in Alaska and he said, are there any Jews here? And the mayor said, well, there's no Jews here. And he said, look, I wanna go to the school and let me just see if I can find any Jews. So he goes to the small school and he asks the group of children, he says, does anybody here know any Jews? And one young girl raises her hand and says, I know a Jew, my mother's Jewish. And then he says to himself, what is he going to say to this girl in that moment? And this is what he says. He says, every Friday night, Jews all over the world light candles. We try to emulate God as God brought light into darkness. That's what we remind ourselves of our capacity. And he said, Alaska, he said to this girl, is one of the furthest, most 
places that's the West in the world. It's one of the last places in the world to bring in Shabbat. And he said to this girl, the whole world is waiting for you to light your Friday night candles. He empowered her with the possibility that her light would truly make a difference because we believe that it does. And that's what we have to bear in mind. It says that at the very beginning of our lives, and this is where the secret of light comes in, God gives us the secret of the light inside of us, the roadmap to becoming our best selves and bringing that light to the world. And then he puts his finger right underneath our noses and the light is buried deep inside. And then at the very end of our lives, God sends an angel. And we recognize that angel because that's the angel that put the light inside of us before we were born. And the angel asks us two questions. Did you reveal the light that I planted within you? Did you do the best that you can with the life that I gave you to maximize your potential and be grateful for every day? Regardless of what your circumstances are, did you lament your fate or did you create a new destiny? Did you choose to respond in a positive way? And then God says, not only did you reveal the light within you, but did you share that light with the world? And if each and every one of us can answer that question, and I'm not a prophet, but I can tell you this, that if you wake up in the morning tomorrow and say three things, and at night, God, I know you believe in me, because I'm awake. I'm awake. I can get out of my bed. Number two, what am I going to do today to help appreciate the gift of today? How am I going to be more mindful today? And then how am I going to help change one person's world today? And then at the end of the night, ask those questions. God willing, I do believe that we'll be granted more light in the world, that God willing, God will watch over us, and God willing will truly, will not just lament this moment, but will harness this moment to truly create a better version of ourselves, our families, our community, and God willing, God's light will shine over all of humanity in peace and joy very soon. Thanks. <laughs> oh, thank you, Rabbi. That was amazing. Uh, do you want thank to say you. anything, uh, Alex? Uh, no, I'm 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 great. I, all I all I, I just <laughs> I just implore everybody to uh, if you have not gotten the book to read Rabbi Cohen's book because it's one of my one of my favorite books. And uh, I thank you. Know, Thanks. Um, and show it. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? I didn't get any questions in the uh, in the chat box, but I think uh, if people can find it, I mean, if we're not, um, let's see. I got one question from Gary Smith. Ah, uh, Gary. <laughs> uh, when did you realize you could make a difference? Wow. The other Gary great... Smith. <laughs> It's our gear. We have two Gary Smiths. I think this is the Seaboard Gary Smith. But uh. Okay. So hello, Seaboard Gary Smith. Um, you know, one of the things, it's a great question, um, was one of the things my parents did for me, I write about this a little bit in the book, is that they would always take me with them when they were doing something, not always, but many times. If they were, I remember as a kid, I'm in the 1970s, my father taking me to a rally for Soviet jury. And I don't remember what was said, but I remember the singing of Am Yisrael Chai. You know, I remember going to visit people with them. In other words, you know, it was probably early on, you know, values are not taught. This is a euphem, it's a cliche, but it's so true. We learn more from what we experience than what people tell us. Something like my parents said, you can make a difference. But they showed me how I could participate with them in helping uh, the world around me. We had a very open home. And I remember I would help serve, I would help clean, I would sing, I would help the environment, uh, you know, to, to make people feel comfortable, greet people at the door. We'd walk people to the end of our driveway, waving to them. So the last thing they would see was the Cohen family. <laughs> they were leaving the road. Um, but it was, it was kind of at a young age. And I think that um, I've always tried to do that with my kids, um, just really try to bring them places where I feel they can see that they can make a difference, you know, because that's you, you experience that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, oh. The um, people have been really moved most, by, by your. Uh, I see there's another question there about my yeah. most impactful no, Elijah oh, moment. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. 
No, I was going to read them so you didn't have to pay attention, but you saw the question. Okay, good. So, so you can answer it. Okay. Oh my gosh, my most impactful Elijah moment. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, I've had, thank God, many, but um, I'll give you, I was talking a few years ago, I was at um, um, American Jewish Committee, I guess, talking in Westchester, and I talked about the Elijah moment, and then um, a woman raises her hand and says, you know, and she heard that, obviously, she knew my mom passed away, she says, I want you to know that I am in my place in life today because of your mom. And no, I knew what she was talking about. And she said to me that um, when she was in her 20s, she was down in Atlanta. She had just um, lost, broke up from a boyfriend. She was going to law school down in Emory, all alone and really in a funk. And she shared that my mom was one of the people really that brought her in and gave her a new chizuk, new hope. And, you know, when I heard that, it for me was this obviously, you know, my mom's not living physically anymore. I believe that she's with me all the time. But it was another reminder of the simple um, way that we have through our warmth and connection to help somebody at a moment where for us, again, it may be five minutes or maybe even a few meals or a few days, but it can help a person at a pivotal crossroads in their life and literally change the course of their life. I feel... And this is the way I look at life that, you know, you know, there's so many people that helped me get to where I am and there are Elijah's in my life. I and mean, I try to reflect on that too. Um, but I'm always thinking about new Elijah moments. Um, I'll, one last one. I mean, this whole making mitzvah moments thing is, is to me like a great example of it. I mean, I just imagine we have done and people have done so many mitzvot almost that have appeared out of nowhere, but, you know, when somebody, you know, needs something and they don't even know, but then through a WhatsApp group, they're able to connect and then it leads to another mitzvah. It's called mitzvah momentum. To me, um, that's also raised the awareness of how we can bring people together in a positive way through technology to create hundreds, if not thousands um, of Elijah moments. So there's a lot going on, but uh, feel free, by the way, to email me. And uh, if people do have Elijah moments in their life, I collect them. <laughs> I like to read about them. So you can uh, send me a note. I also just want to point out that we just put up something on my uh, website, um, which is if you go on there, there's a free download of the first chapter of the book, which is about how do you want to be remembered. So if you go on the website, RabbiDanielCohen.com, and just like sign up, even if you don't have the book, you can download it because I'm trying to encourage people during this time of COVID to think deeply about these questions about how they want to be remembered. And uh, is your email on the website or what your, can you share? Um, yeah, so email? you go into, just go Rabbi Daniel Cohen and then you can contact me that way. And then um, you can send me an email through there. Yep. Great. Great. Um, we have a question. Let's see. Let's see from Dan Moldover. Is there a ritual or process that helps uh, you be more mindful on a daily or other regular basis? Um, yeah, I mean, for me, um, I would say number one, prayer helps. And to me, it's less about, um, uh, the, the, the quantity and it's the quality, you know, Moda Ani is important prayer for me. The past few years, I've gotten into the book of Psalms a lot and I read the Psalms. It's a reminder that God is with me at all times. To me, one of the most inspiring Psalms is Psalm 16, where I remember that God is in front of me always, you know, there's a beautiful story about, um, you know, Rav Nachman of Breslau said, the whole world is a narrow bridge. You know this song. I think you probably got to like to sing it. Kola olam kulo. It's a big favorite. The entire world is a narrow bridge. And then it says, Baha'i kar, the most important thing, is lo lefached klal, not to be afraid. The original version of that, according to um, many people, is not lo lefached, not to be afraid, but lo lehitz pached. Don't make yourself afraid. <laughs> Don't be filled with anxiety. And uh, there's a beautiful story that was shared about a uh, group of people that were in uh, Siberia. And there was a fellow who was a trapeze walker who was putting some rope between two different mountains. And he said, you know, who wants to walk across this trapeze, or this um, rope, tie rope? And nobody wanted to go. And, and then he said, I can go in the wheelbarrow. I can go backwards. Who wants to go? And nobody wanted to go. And then there was this little girl that said, I'll go. I'll go in the wagon. 
and she goes at the mountaintop and she goes in the wagon and he brings her back and forth. And people say, how did you have the guts? Nobody went in this wheelbarrow. How did you have the guts to walk in the wheelbarrow with this uh, tightrope walker? And he said, she said, the tightrope walker is my father. The tightrope walker is my father. And I knew he never put me in a situation that I couldn't make it. God's our father. I remember that every day. God loves us. We wouldn't do anything to our children that would put them in any harm. God's our father. It is a narrow bridge. But when I remember that and, and I'm conscious of that, I know that God has my best interest in mind. And he basically give me a pat on the back and a big bear hug in the morning and say, go out there and get them and be my best ambassador. So you know, everybody has different rituals, but the prayers are important. You know, keeping a gratitude journal, which my daughter does, is important. That's why I encourage you to do that. Write down something every day that's different that you're grateful for. That's also something else to help. Uh, we have a question from Steve, uh, Steve Mandel. Uh, where does science play in your religion? Are they sometimes in conflict or is there a bridge? Um, I definitely believe there's a bridge. I mean, um, I think that, um, you know, it's possible. One of my teachers in, uh, in Yeshiva University was Rabbi Moshe Tendler, who was a noted rabbi and also the son-in-law of Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. I think that, look, there are some times when you know, science is in conflict, but I do think that actually science helps us appreciate more of the divinity within the world. I mean, Maimonides says that. He says that you should study science so you can appreciate uh, the beauty of everything of God in the world. And, you know, there are a lot of people that are wiser than me that have navigated it. I'm not saying there aren't certain conflicts um, at certain things, but I do think they can coexist and there are different um, you know, the different disciplines that enable us to accomplish different things. God actually wants us to use our minds and technology um, and, and, and ability to harness the best of science to help in a positive way. When science or any technology becomes a God in and of itself, that to me is idolatry. Science and technology is a means. It's a means to help others. It's a means to, to help make the world a better place. And everybody has to have humility, whatever they are, is to, you know, be uh, have, have humble that there's always more that we can learn. Nobody's, you know, so that's something to reflect on. If you send me an email, by the way, on the science question, I'll give you some resources that I think can help, help expand uh, your understanding. Uh, do we have any other questions? I think I have, let me see, from Gary Smith again. Is it? Do you have an example of a moment that brought you to tears, to positive tears? He said. Yeah, I'll give you one. <laughs> I mean, um, this related, it was actually something I was going to share um, uh, earlier on in the Living Inspired piece, but one of the most moving times for me um, as a rabbi is when I officiate at weddings. I get very emotional. You know, I kind of have a unique vantage point because I'm the only one. Everybody's looking at the chuppah. I'm standing looking at everybody else. And I can uh, see the face of the, the parents walking with the groom and the parents, the bride. And I always get a little bit teary because I, I feel all the bent up dreams that are finally coming to reality. A number of years ago, um, I did a wedding for a woman who lost her mother at a young age, almost similar to me. And I was standing underneath the chuppah. And sometimes I'll get teary, but this time I just literally, I just couldn't stop. Uh, I was crying and it was obvious that I was crying. even though there were a couple hundred people there and I asked the person next to me for tissue. And I was wondering, this, for me it was a living inspired moment too because I said people are, I could either hold it all in or I could explain to people, why is the rabbi crying at this wedding? It's, it's not his own kids. Like, what is he, why is he bawling so much at this wedding? So I decided that I would open up. And this is what I said. Um, this is what I, I said. I said to the woman, I said, I'm crying because my mother was not at my wedding either. And it was very painful. And I said, I understand to some degree the pain that you're going through right now that your mother's not here. But then I said to her, I said, even though my mother wasn't physically there, I felt my mother's presence under the chuppah at the wedding. And I believe that your mother is fully present in this moment as well. And I would say that emotional outpouring, it wasn't tears of sadness as much as it was of comfort for her and for me, 
it was it enabled her to exhale a little bit, to feel her mother's presence, because I could relate to her in that moment. And I'm just so glad that I opened up my heart and soul and, and cried, because it really enabled her to feel more connected. Well, thank you. Uh, I think I have one more question we're going to finish up with, which is a uh, fairly uh, interesting one uh, from Paul Peck. He said, Rabbi, fabulous message. At some point, this quarantine will end and we'll be heading back to our old ways. How do you recommend we remember your message when we get caught up in regular living? Is that meant to be a promo for my book? Just read the book. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I'm saying is part of the reason why I wrote the book, and I'm not just saying it's a book. I mean, I, you know, here's the thing. Rabbi Moshe Chaim Luzato, who's one of the great philosophers of all time, is up there as the Babe Ruth of Jewish philosophers. Okay? He wrote in The Path of the Just, which is great work. He said, all I'm here to do is remind you of the obvious. Everything that I'm telling you tonight, it's not like something, it's not rocket science, but it's about being disciplined to really recognize, again, the gift of every day, to be grateful. And I do feel that being mindful after a crisis does take discipline. It takes discipline because our natural inclination is to go back to bad habits. Kierkegaard wrote, he said, a boredom is the root of all evil. When we're mindlessness and we're just moving around, then we let life fritter away. But life uh, was not meant to be a highlight film. The Kutzka Rebbe said that my job in life is not to resurrect the dead. My job in life is to resurrect the living. A lot of people are walking around and they're not really living. But I do believe that if you go through a process of creating, and here's my point, uh, what's called in Hebrew, cheshbon hanefesh. Discipline yourself, you know, 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes at night to think deeply about why you're here. Write down what's important to you. Do a, you know, we check our stocks five times a day. We should be making sure that our souls are in sync with our bodies at least twice a day. I think if we're mindful about ritualizing those, those check-ins through prayer, through journaling, and by the way, this is also important, action. When you do a mitzvah, it creates something positive inside of you. And even if you don't feel like it, it makes that day meaningful. And Torah study. For me, the day could be busy, but if I spend 10 minutes doing some studying, ritualize it, I feel that I've actually done something meaningful that day. So I would suggest, like you schedule an appointment for exercising, schedule an appointment for prayer, schedule one for study, and schedule an appointment to do one good deed. Every day, I'm going to call somebody and thank them for how, what they mean in my life. You know, try that. And then reaching out to somebody, you, your life will be radically different within about a week. Wonderful. Uh, this has been very moving for everybody, uh, I think, and very... Uh, especially in this difficult time. And it's been a, some powerful and inspirational messages for all of us. I'm going to... Do you mind I'm, if I say one thing? Yeah. I just find there's a question that's in the chat. I, I have to say something. I don't feel, I feel bad just leaving it out there, um, okay. which is dealing with random evil. You know, that's a deep question, by the way. Um, I don't believe, by the way, that anything is random. That's kind of what I said before. I, I do believe that um, we won't understand we don't understand why the virus happened. We don't understand why, you know, nobody knows why the Holocaust happened, all tragedies. But, you know, we have to accept the fact that we won't understand why. And that's God's purview. But our purview is to say, okay, not to get stuck in that, because that could eat up our whole life, the questions of theodicy. Moses asked God, Moses, God, why bad things happen to good people? And God says to Moses, you can see my back, you can't see my face. What he meant by that is that you're not gonna know that right now. Your job is in this moment to choose life, to do something positive, and then God willing, you'll move from there. But again, um, whoever actually it was- um, Michael was Freilich. Yeah, Michael Freilich, if you wanna send me an email, I'm happy to send you some resources on that too. That's a big question and there's no easy answer for that, okay. Well, thank you. I'm going to unmute everybody for a second just so they can thank you also. Uh, and then everybody should stay on because I have a couple of uh, FTMC related messages. But thank okay. you very much. And My that, pleasure. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for your time. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. All right. I'm going to just um, wrap this up for a minute. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, it's been very meaningful. Uh, I just want to mention a couple of other FJMC related things, which I would be, I think, in trouble if I didn't, which is uh, that um, we have, as you know, the uh, convention coming up in uh, 2021, and we're already starting to uh, to put out the word to all the uh, clubs and to the regions about this and that, you know, people are signing up now uh, to do installment payments. You can do installment payments, pay whatever you can, $50, $100 a month uh, uh, for the time being to make a down payment on convention. Uh, so that's on the, uh, on the FJMC website. And also one other thing that I would like to mention is that, um, let's see if I can find this. Seaboard has been organizing with uh, Tri-State with uh, Mike Rosenberg there and other regions to try to get uh, some donations to help the Abayudaya community in Uganda. They're really struggling right now. And uh, they're all closed in too. They can't work. The schools are closed. The synagogues are closed. And with them, a little bit goes a long way. Uh, $50 a month will support a family there. So where the regions can do it on their own, or you can find out how to send individual donations. But we're trying to work with the men's club there with Aaron Quinto Moses and Alan Zalaba in order to to get the money channeled to uh, to the right people. So whatever you can do on that would be helpful. And uh, I'm gonna just unmute every everybody for a minute. Thanks for joining us. If anybody has any final comments. So, yeah, hi, this is uh, David Fryman from Shari Torah. Um, I just uh, wanted to piggyback on on the message that um, Bob just gave about the Abba Yudaya. And, and I really hope that you guys consider uh, making a donation. Uh, we've set up with Alan and with uh, Aaron is for, for us to have an opportunity to really feed families. And I'm in touch with a number of guys over there. Um, in, case you don't, uh, in case you don't know, I, was, I went to Uganda for the um, 100th anniversary of the last summer. And I can tell you that it is dire, very, very dire, like eating rats in the street dire. Um, so to the extent that you guys can contribute to this, um, I, 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 I would be forever grateful. And I know that they would as well. Yeah. Um, I, I've sent a bunch of money over there. I've organized with some other folks to send, send some money and it is extraordinarily appreciated. And, and if, you, if you can give, I think it's, it's literally putting hands in the, in money in the hands of the people that, that need it in order to buy food. Um, and, and it is a, uh, it, it's a very meaningful give. So I, I hope that you guys uh, take an opportunity to, uh, to contribute. At least. And if you want to use the, if you oh, want to use where this, you contribute? Okay. That's your house. If you want to use the Seaboard um, site, have us, um, I just put the link in the, in the chat here. It's abayudaya.seaboardfjmc.us and the money will go directly to them. David will get it to them. It'll come into our account. It'll go right out to them. Okay. To them. Okay. We've I'm already uh, provided about $1,600 through this these regional channels to them. Any other comments or questions? Summerfield out in California. Yeah. Okay. I thanks. just want to thank. Um, hey, Norman. Thank Alex and yeah. and thank Bob for pulling this together. This is wonderful. And my wife Lori is here too, and she says thank you. <laughs> thank you Hello. for opening it up outside the region. Yes, thank you. Truly appreciated. Most appreciated. Thank you.
Yeah. You're welcome, and and we Western hope region will do the same in May. I think it's May uh, 17. With your regional uh, retreat, right? We have a May 17 on Sunday. We have a program too. Oh. Three hours in the morning, and we invite it up to everybody as well. We'll come up with more information. Great. So we and, follow and, the lead of Seaboard. And we may be having some more specific, like club oriented training and such, that we think we can open up to other regions as well. Um, Mark Berlin's working with us to do some of the mo pro other programming that we were going to do at our retreat. So we won't be doing it in one chunk, we'll be staggering it over the next several weeks. Good. So thanks, good. guys. Thank you, Bob. Everybody thank you. Bob. Yes, thanks, Alex. Thank you very much. Organizing all of this. Thank you. Thank you for the invite, Bob. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Bob. Right. Go ahead. Thanks, thanks Alex. You, Alex. Thanks, well. Alex. Stay well, everybody. Thank you. Night, yes. Guys. Be well. Stay well. Stay, stay safe. Well.